Hello everyone, welcome to our presentation. So we had two papers to work on. We are going to talk about uh, from the, uh, my name is Akbar, I'm from Tajikistan, and this is Elidavid from Austria, and uh, Jan from Colombia. Uh -huh. So, and uh, we are going to present two papers, uh, which is from the doom loop to an economy for work, not wealth, which was the main and primary paper that we had to work on. Mm -hmm. And we had complementary one, which was beyond growth. Um, so let's start. And this is the overview of what we're going to do in this presentation. We're going to provide the summary of the papers, combining two of them. And we're going to provide some uh, opinions and uh, critiques, let's say, uh, which will be about wealth taxes and secular stagnation. Mm -hmm. And we'll then end with questions. Mm -hmm. So to start with, so in, in, in today's economy, so we see there is a huge gap that exists uh, between um, like decline in wages and the rise of wealth uh, accumulation mm -hmm. globally. And this gap highlights systemic, systematic imbalances that requires the re-evaluation of economic governance and policy frameworks. And essentially, this paper explores this phenomena uh, by analyzing the divergence between diminishing wages and expanding wealth, while advocating for an economic model centered on the well-being of the workers. So that was the. And to summarize, so it was. <laughs> to summarize, um, basically, it outlines a couple of themes. Uh, which we outlined here. The first one would be the doom loop dynamics and the austerity and its consequences. So basically the papers, they introduced the concept of doom loop uh, where low economic growth um, leads to cycle of austerity me measures, which further limits growth and worsens social inequalities. So and the papers they present key indicators affected by that doom loop, which are GDP, wage, public services, and inflation. And the paper critiques austerity policies that have been Im implemented in 2010, specifically in UK, and that highlights the adverse effects on economic growth at that time and still living standards and income disparities for workers. So it also argues for shift towards expansionary fiscal policies to stimulate economic growth and address income disparities. And the second team that it uh, includes is scientific error that has been mentioned and policy assumptions. That discussion basically deepens into the perceived scientific error, which is a misconception around, as you have just mentioned about, to be short about uh, the supply and De, um, and demand side that you have just mentioned, like overproduction and decreasing pro productivity, but also um, yeah, but also demand deficiency that people don't not do not have enough to buy all of these goods and services. And the third topic that has been discussed is the wealth disparities and economic imbalances. That would be. So it provides historical trajectory of UK, UK economy comparing pre-1979 growth patterns with post um, uh, trends marked by increasing wealth. If before it was about increase in, uh, in uh, income of labor, but the post is associated with increasing wealth inequality and fa financial spe speculations. Um, Yes, and basically, uh, and the fourth that is importance of workers that that was the center part of the paper. So it critiques the mainstream economic theories, which I liked a lot, um, and calls for reorientation of powers towards working people and taking the power from um, from uh, from like wealthy elite, let's say, and, and of course the inspiration is coming from Keynesian principles that you've already mentioned that the, you, you need to prioritize the labor over capital um, and also re-evaluating policy frameworks to achieve inclusive, eco inclusive economic growth 
and social justice, which is the inspiration taken from the IMF calls, new uh, Britain Woods moment. Um, so lastly, uh, it, it includes climate crisis and intersectionality of uh, economic policy. So it discusses the interconnected of economic policies with global climate crisis, climate goals and global equity, and urging holistic approach to address these challenges and advocating for a new paradigm shift towards sustainable development and equal equitable resource distribution. And now I would like to give the floor to Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so I will now turn to the points of critique or rather things that could have uh, benefited the paper if they were additional elaboration on it. So as the paper frequently discussed uh, wealth taxes um, and redistribution, we wanted to look deeper into the issue of wealth inequality and taxation. Um, so we find um, that the TUC report is a significant contribution to the ongoing discourse of economic policy foremost because it importantly explores the link between wealth inequality and omis uh, emissions on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So, however, our critique revolves around the depth of the paper's uh, policy implications concerning uh, wealth taxation and uh, practical challenges it omits and uh, potential enhancement of its empirical data usage. Mm -hmm. um, so, firstly, while the paper advocates for wealth taxation taxation, it falls short of uh, discussing uh, the specific forms that this taxation should take. Um, so this omission leaves a gap in our understanding of the practical implications of uh, such policies. Um, additionally, we found that the paper overlooks the crucial issue of uh, tax evasion, especially among uh, the super rich. So a more comprehensive discussion about these practical problems uh, could have uh, enriched the paper's outlook. Um, secondly, we found that an historical analysis of wealth uh, taxation, um, for example, in the OECD context, uh, could have provided valuable insights into the reasons behind the sharp reduction of wealth uh, taxation over the last years, and also, um, therefore, gave a better discussion about the pos possibility of reinstating such forms of taxation. Um, so to better understand the extent of the sharp decline, we looked into uh, the OECD context and found that in 1990, 12 OECD countries um, had wealth taxations, whereas in 2017 and 18, only three of those remained, which is a pretty stark decline. Thank you. Um, we also wanted to critically examine the empirical data uh, for potential critiques and suggestions for improvement. So to accomplish this, we delve deeper into the broader literature on wealth inequality, and we focused on a specific paper by Zuckmann et al. Um, and this choice per is particularly relevant to our earlier point of critique about emphasizing the significance of um, incorporating tax evasion into the discussion on wealth inequality and taxation. So our investigation revealed two crucial aspects. Uh, firstly, that there's an issue of missing data in previous wealth inequality calculations if tax evasion is not considered. And secondly, therefore, that the asset shares of the top 1% appear to be strongly underestimated in the existing li literature. So again, we found this by looking at the Zuckmann et al. paper, and uh, this paper undertook a comprehensive investigation into offshore tax evasion and was quite empirically rigorous and drew from a very diverse data set which also included uh, leaked microdata from offshore accounts such as the HSBC Swiss leaks and the Panama Papers. Mm. So the findings revealed that uh, offshore tax evasion is highly concentrated at the very top of the global wealth distribution, uh, particularly within the 0.01%, which evade about 25% of their taxes. 
So moreover, these findings uh, shed light on the missing data in previous wealth inequality calculations, and we found that the TUC report could have benefited from including uh, the consideration of offshore tax evasion um, for providing a very accurate uh, picture of wealth inequality, but also for the policy recommendations especially uh, regarding the rethink of uh, banking policies and financial institutions. I will now hand. And uh, we came up with questions, but we'll discuss them at the end of the presentation. So, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So, uh, now I'm going to move to talk a little bit about uh, going beyond secular stagnation and affinity planet, because I think the text, or the text we read, actually delve into both topics, and we want uh, to further discuss some topics. So basically, what secular stagnation, and basically it's the trend of uh, uh, long-term trends of high-income countries to have uh, low uh, economic growth rates or close to zero economic growth rates, and why the debate uh, became important was basically after the global financial crisis and the euro crisis because there was a weak recovery of high-income countries. And among the speakers, we have uh, Larry Summers uh, that you can see from a uh, tropical beach in Florida, but we all have also, and it's important to say that uh, the debates about secular stagnation have been quite important over the history of economic thought. We have Ricardo, Roxa Luxemburg, but especially Joseph Stindl, who wrote like a really nice book about it. And what are some trends of secular stagnation? Uh, because we think the, the paper we read is actually framing this debate. So we have declining trends, uh, growth rates, uh, a declining trend in the growth rate of GDP. You can see in the left hand side panel, but you can also see it for uh, growth fixed capital formation. But uh, in the right hand side panel, you can see declining trend in labor productivity growth per employee, but also per hour work it. And in the last decade, it, was average, uh, it averaged uh, zero person in this country. So since we are talking about one debate, so we need to take into account both sides and we have a supply side vision that is quite a mainstream vision that the paper and well, uh, is quite critical about it. And what are the reasons for secular stagnation? Basically, we have lower potential output growth rate because now population is, is growing at lower rates or innovations are less disruptive than they used to be before. However, there is other point that is quite complementary to it. It says, okay, we have a declining out, uh, potential output rates, but we also have uh, a, a situation in which the actual growth rate of the economy are permanently below the potential growth rates. And this is because the natural interest rate required to make uh, the actual and the potential rates equal is highly negative. And this means that it cannot be achieved uh, justly by monetary policy because we have the problem with the zero lower bound. However, we have I mean, uh, when we look at an heterodox, more heterodox perspective, and here I'm, based, uh, I'm more based on a paper written by a professor, Edgar Hein, uh, titled Secular Stagnation or Stagnation Policy, that this supply side vision is, bears, is barely quite limited to address uh, the issue of secular stagnation. Why? Because it does not acknowledge uh, for the changes in institution, macroeconomic policy management, uh, the shift in power relationship between uh, labor and capital, and especially the rise of finance. So I think uh, the present, in the presentation you were uh, quite clear about it, but I mean, uh, higher inequalities have affected the uh, possibility of consumption of the working class. Basically, we have pre-tax because uh, declining wage share in value added, but we also have uh, less progressive taxation, as Elizabeth mentioned. We also have, the, uh, I mean, the focus on full employment policy is not uh, too much important now, right now comparison with the 60s or the 70s, here we have a weaker public investment, for instance, or more conservative macroeconomic policy management, as we saw in the last presentation uh, by Mr. Tichet. And we have uh, also financialization, that this idea that the rise of finance has affected uh, the incentives to invest uh, in the real sector. And this translates in weak domestic aggregate demand and basically weak investment affect labor productivity growth in the long term. But what's my reason to go over this debate is because in the paper, we see that the main policy suggestion to going out of this secular stagnation, basically, it's uh, coming back to Bretton Goods, and coming back to Bretton Goods implies like Keynesian type policies. And what type of policies? I mean, expansionary monetary fiscal policies. We have also redistribution from work uh, from capital to labor again fostering welfare state and the main focus of the debate and I think in the paper is also a clear intention okay we need to uh, do that again to foster economic and labor productivity growth however I mean we are not in Bretton Goods time anymore and because we have now more binding environmental constraints I think in, in the paper is not properly
properly address. And you can see, firstly, I mean, in the top panel, you can see a positive relation between labor productivity growth and energy intensity by, by workers. So basically, the more productive our, our workers, the more energy they use uh, to produce. But at the same time, in biophysical terms, in the downside uh, part, you can see that there is a declining trend in the energy return on investment. And this means we need now more energy to produce energy, basically. So if we want to be more productive, we need more energy. But at the same time, we need more energy to produce energy. So wh where are we going to end up? And you can say, OK, this is for fossil fuels. Yes, but it's projected that by mid-century is on. Is on um, it's going to be also the case for renewables energy because this is highly material intensive and at some point will require more energy to get the cobalt or all the minerals to produce wind turbines. And at the end, we also have uh, the classical uh, argument of uh, slow decoupling and basically the physical limitations to the materialized production, even if we have producing a lot of services and digital products now. So. Here I come back to the question because I think we we saw in the present in in the paper at least that uh, I mean how to connect uh, sustainable uh, sustainability and uh, economic growth in order like to foster this secular stagnation is a bit blurry because I think uh, there are many kind of uh, branding names like green growth sustainable growth just transition that at some point uh, are not uh, properly addressing this uh, biophysical tension so we have these questions uh, for you so first uh, how to get out of secular stagnation. With without a simplicity rhetoric of green growth and shifting the burden to the working class. Or if it's the opposite, we shall look for something else. And basically, if child high income countries manage without growth and by manage without growth, I refer to get used to a new normality of low economic growth, low productivity growth, and try to look for our policies, redistribution, for example, with wealth taxes, uh, frugality, that means reduce luxury consumption, or uh, for instance, uh, reduce, uh, stop producing unnecessary things, or working time production as Fridays for Future is climbing for uh, having better living and standard, but also to cope with unemployment. And uh, since politics matters a lot and everything is uh, politic, I mean, we think that it's also interesting for us to know if the latter is politically and economically feasible. And uh, given the current power relationships that are not favorable for labor, but also the rise in the far right. And here I would like, like uh, you to read your questions because you oh right so the questions uh, concerning the first part of the critique uh, where should there be an intergovernmental authority solely focused on tax uh, transparency and enforcement um, to address the global nature of tax evasion and the second one uh, considering the negative portrayal of wealth-based uh, taxation in the media uh, for example, as is the case in Austria and Germany, um, how can public discourse be shaped to allow for a more positive view of uh, wealth taxes? Uh, I'm okay. So first of all, thank you very much. Those were both very insightful, uh, slightly terrifying. Uh, but also profound insights and I apologize for not, for example, addressing your concerns about uh, biophysical limits and how and growth within that and I agree that that is a really big discussion we must have. But let me start with a taxation question. Now I have to say I'm notorious because I neglect the tax question. Uh, I'm forever being criticized for it. But there, for two reasons. One, there is no possibility of taxing the rich in a world of capital mobility, right? So we find that, you know, Amazon and Facebook will invest in Britain. They make their profits in Britain. They shift their profits across to Dublin or wherever there's a low tax environment. And we can do nothing at all about it because there's no friction. There's no chance of stopping them using the, uh, deploying their profits in that way and shifting them. So for me, the problem isn't taxation. Of course, it's a problem. Of course, the rich aren't paying taxes. And, you know, it's morally wrong, never mind economically. But the fact is, as long as we have the current system, you know, any attempt at uh, taxing the rich is hopeless. But what is exciting is what you're saying here about the, uh, the establishment of an intergovernmental authority. If we are going to manage capital mobility, if we're going to say, look, we're going to have some controls over the mobility of capital, thou shalt not move your capital until you've paid your taxes. 
it requires me to work with Ireland, it requires the Europeans to work together, it requires us to work with the United States and with China. It requires an intergovernmental authority, right? So you're absolutely right about that, but the intergovernmental authority should be managing capital mobility in the first instance, and then on the back of that, the reason why the rich don't pay tax is why should they? They can just, you know, I, don't, I can't move my, 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 my bank account across the border tomorrow. I mean, if I try and open a bank account in Ireland, it'll take me months, and they will subject me to all kinds of investigation. It's much easier for the big corporations to do that, and they do that. So for me, the priority has always been capital mobility. And in the absence of management of capital flows, then all talk about wealth taxation is just pie in the sky, right? So that's partly my, and that is careless, and, and I'm forever being critiqued for not saying enough about the need to tax the wealthy, really. So what's happened in the, uh, we have ca capital controls in Britain, believe it or not, we do. So we had a problem where we had finite assets called London property. Victorian buildings that, that leak and are, are falling down, they shouldn't be there actually because they're so old. But they're a very valuable asset. And Russian oligarchs throw loads of money at this finite asset and inflate the price of the asset in the process. Not just uh, Russian oligarchs, but, you know, the rich from all over the place, China and so on. And so the Bank of England said that for those foreigners wanting to buy London property, they would be required to put down a bigger deposit in the first instance than locals have to put down. In other words, you'd have to pay down a bigger share of the outstanding value of the property um, than, than, for example, I would have to pay as a resident in London. That is a form of capital control. What that did was immediately to cool the property market in London. So it is possible for central banks and governments to do something about capital mobility. It's a form of taxation to say to a Russian oligarch, you've got to pay far more if you're going to buy a London property, right? You're taxing him essentially. Um, but until we do that, then talk of tax is pie in the sky. So that's my bias, and it's not a good one, and you're very right to correct me on that. So I thank you for that. Now, on the question of secular stagnation, I think we have secular stagnation <coughs> because of neoliberalism, because of the form of capitalism that we have. I come back to Cecil John Rhodes. He didn't invest at home. He invested in you know, what was a virgin territory, basically, where it was easy to quickly extract fantastic wealth at virtually no effort. And he did not invest at home to increase productivity at home. That's our problem, right? What do we do about it? Uh, well, how, what do we do about increasing investment? Now, we need to invest in transform our, transforming our economy away from fossil fuels, right? That will take money. But then we come up against the, the point which, um, sorry, the chap from Colombia, where are you, said yes, <coughs> which are biophysical limits and growth. And um, in a sense, you know, when Greens argue for degrowth, I say, well, why don't you have neoliberal policies? They're degrowth policies, basically. If you go to Africa, where growth went into reverse through the through 80s and 90s, as long as IMF policies were in place. If you go to Latin America, I was in Bogota last week. If you go to Latin America, you can see growth going backwards, right? That's called neoliberalism. So um, there is a problem with that because it leads to very high levels of unemployment. And that, in my view, is, as someone who's a green, is, that we, we, is intolerable. On the other hand, what's also intolerable is ex excessive exponential growth within biophysical limits. And so I would argue that <coughs> a, a green economy is going to be a labour-intensive economy. And if I can put this in very colloquial terms, in Britain, we don't grow our own green beans. We import beans from Kenya, right? They get flown over to us fresh the day they're picked, right? So we drain Kenya's water table in order to grow those beans. 
we, we use her cheap labour to grow those beans, and then we emit all kinds of toxic emissions while it's flown across to our dinner tables on a daily basis. That will have to stop in a green economy. We're going to have to grow our own green beans. And so for me, the green economy is going to be a more labour-intensive economy. We're going to have to substitute labour for fossil fuel energy, right? So before we just relied on fossil fuels to deliver our green beans to our pockets, now we're going to have to do the hard graft of growing those green and eating locally and eating sustainably and so on. So the whole question of what kind of economy is a sustainable economy is a deep and profound one and I admit that I'd never even touched on it in this presentation. But I think what I, I mean for me I don't like the word growth. I, I, I have, I'm writing a piece at the moment about how it was invented um, in 1961 by the OECD and by Samuel Britton, who was the chief economist on the Financial Times. Before that, Keynes would look at levels, Keynes and Keynesians would look at levels of economic activity. Was employment too high and therefore inflationary, or is it too low and therefore high unemployment? Output, investment interest rates, the exchange rate, you know, where were they? And he would look at every discrete uh, element and add them up and decide whether or not there was imbalances. Now we have one number called GDP, which is a function, a continuous function, if you like, um, which is expected to change every year and to go upwards to measure <coughs> the success of an economy. And so I, I hate the whole thing of GDP because what happened was in 61, we moved away from actually measuring what was really going on in the economy towards setting these targets. At the time, Britain had full employment. Uh, Harold Macmillan made speeches about how we'd never had it so good. At a time of full employment, Britain and the OECD set a target for Britain to increase um, GDP by 50% over 10 years. That was crazy in the time of full employment. <clears throat> so what that did was to be inflationary. It was massively inflationary. And then we had inflation and everybody said this is Keynes. We blame Keynes for this inflation and inflation's always been associated with Keynes as a result. <clears throat> Keynes hated inflation. He understood it was a, a dangerous thing. But it wasn't Keynesian at all. It was the neoliberal project to establish GDP as the standard. So instead of the gold standard, we now had the GDP standard, right? And that was one that would just rise exponentially. That is not sustainable for a green economy. We're going to have to change that. But what is sustainable is to give people work. And that work doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to emit. So the debate we're having in Scotland is does the oil rig worker move into the, the in, uh, investment in social infrastructure? We're stressing how important it is to build resilient social infrastructure to deal with the crisis. And we have oil rig workers saying, huh, you mean I've got to go and look and nurse little old ladies in the hospital? I'm not going to do that, you know, because anyway, it's very low paid. So we're arguing, yes, building social infrastructure as opposed to physical infrastructure is even more important in a green economy. And that means education, it means the arts, it means science, it means music, it means all of those things which we have to upskill and make sure they're properly rewarded. So work doesn't have to be work that's, um, if you like, uh, carbon related. But having that debate in Scotland is extremely difficult, as you can imagine. It's not an easy thing and it's something we have to really, I mean, so I would hope that you're all putting your minds to what that economy should look like within the biophysical limits that we face. And the whole question of growth and productivity and so on, what really matters is are we going to be able to survive on this little planet of ours? So thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you very much. I really, um, really enjoyed this lecture. Um, I'm Nina from the UK, by the way. Um, <laughs> if you can't tell from the accent. Um, 
So I really, really agree with a lot of the policies and a lot of the... Inst so this is going a bit backwards. And it relates to the final question here. Yeah. Um, that I really enjoy these... Um, uh, and really believe that we need to change fundamentally the international monetary system yeah. and we need to change the way in which the treasury and central banks work and how we fund yeah. uh, the entrepreneurial state, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. However, my questions uh, both lie in the field of the power relations uh, and how this can be achieved given power. So take, for example, with the consolidation of the reconsolidation of Treasury and the central bank and an entrepreneurial state, given that this is a, we're talking, for example, in the UK, a democratic yeah. country yeah. with very short terms of five years, mm -hmm. is there not a massive risk of like the revenge of the rentiers in this democratic system? Yeah. And how, like, what is the feasibility of this, of, of some of these ideas with the democratic and political landscape that we have with a special, like, a lot of power within the rentiers. Sure. And then my second question relates to the international scale regarding the uh, power imbalances in the institutions like the IMF mm -hmm. and the power that the Fed holds. Mm -hmm. And so moving towards an ICU or a uh, world central bank, mm -hmm. What is the feasibility of that? Because it, I, I just don't see the Fed giving up power to, for example, like, I mean, the, Af the whole African uh, continent has 5% voting rights in the IMF. And mm -hmm. so I don't see that giving up of power, but what can be done to change that? Yeah. And should we then instead be looking at more transitory mechanisms like expanding the role of SDRs towards a state of ICU, or do we need these? Do we just need to have altruistic fed people? Basically? Right. So we have more than one question? Two or two, or two. Let's say two. They're very yeah. big questions. Yeah. <coughs> so my question, Gabriel from Brazil, first of all. Uh, my question goes a bit in the last one and a bit on the context of the presentation. Uh, you were discussing this trend of now uh, the wealth being much more powerful than they have been in, the, in, the, in recent history. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask, uh, especially think about Hobsbawm here, the British historian, about the lack of revolutionary struggles and uh, this really yeah. threat of a revolution uh, didn't it cause for the dominant class to feel like the waken the, the, the fear and of course the strength of the working class in conquering more uh, bargaining power? What is your thought on that? Yeah. Okay. You can, uh, maybe you can answer and we will. You, you can take your. Yeah, quickly, go on. Okay, um, my, my question would be uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Max uh, from Germany. And uh, I have a question about, um, you know, like I, I get the impression from uh, your presentation that uh, if only like, and I'm, I'm very okay with that, like, but to say, okay, we do, we, we, we go back to like the Keynesian managed economy uh, yeah. of the 50s to 70s, let's say it's even well regulated, all countries are more or less balanced uh, in terms of surpluses and deficits internationally, but are you not too optimistic that even such a system would be fundamentally unjust and environmentally exploitative? I'd argue that we have to go much further and think about uh, like active state and community planning, decommodifying like a lot of um, as, uh, like parts of the market which are commodified right now. Like, uh, do you not see the, the need to like go much further beyond Green New Deal type proposals to really go into back to, not back, but like kind of new kind of planning, state planning, community planning? Yeah. Whew. Right. Okay. Good. So good question. So power. We're really dealing with power. So I want to say two things on that. First of all, there's two, there's two scenarios. We can either have reasoned debate and transformation amongst reasonable people, and we have leaders who've got good sense, or we can have chaos and crisis, right? And it's clear to me now, I'm not I'm an optimist at heart, but right now I'm very pessimistic, right? So the way this is going to happen is we're going to blow up the global economy in the way we did in the 1930s. It is just such a 
kind of repetition of the 30s. It's so awful to watch it happening. The question then will be, what will be the pl plan B? And uh, for me, the question now is, we've got to start thinking about an alternative, <coughs> even though the power seems immense and the possibility of transformation seems utopian, right? But if we're not talking about the possibility of an alternative, we won't be there. So what I was really upset, because I wrote a book in 2005-06 predicting the great financial crisis. My publisher insisted on calling it the coming first world debt crisis. And I said, ah, oh, you can't call it that because it's going to be published in September 2006. By then the crisis will have come, I said, and my book will be out of date straight away. And she said, no, she had the legal rights over the title, so I couldn't choose. I didn't like first, third world, all that stuff. But anyway, so come September 2, that the crisis hasn't happened. I can't believe that it's still going on. And it goes on and goes on until 9th of August 2007, the thing blows up, right? Um, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because... Um, oh, yes, I'm telling you this because... So the thing blew up and it was horrible. At that point, I thought, ah, oh, the left is going to rise up and say, we have an end to the system and we're going to transform. And there was absolute silence. People walk around like, we didn't know this could happen, right? Jaws dropped. We didn't know. So nobody, there were no revolutionaries. There was no radical saying, there's something terribly wrong. We've got to do something. Everybody was just stunned. And not just Greenspan who's supposed to know about these things, or Mr. Trichet, but also the left. You know, there was no progressive party that said, we've got, so what happened is they consolidated their power. I'll never forget the moment when um, the bankers thought they were going to jail. They actually said so. If you read the columns of the Financial Times, you heard them saying, well, you know, well, what, what are we going to do? Because we are liable here. And then Gordon Brown said, no, 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 don't worry about that. Come into the Treasury and tell us how to solve this problem. Because you are the financial whiz kids who know how to deal with the financial. So please, you're welcome. They could not believe their luck, right? And so they consolidated their power. Before the financial crisis, if you took a risk and you gambled, the state wouldn't bail you out. Today, there isn't a bank in the world that can fail. They are all too big to fail. They will never be allowed to fail, right? They, they are backed by the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, and the ECB. So they are much stronger than they were in 2007-9. So the reason I was giving you my sad tale of my book was that I was so shocked that there was no plan, plan B, that we weren't ready for that, and we didn't know that there could be an alternative, right? So that's number one. Number two, we underestimate our power. Right? We don't understand the extent to which the private finance sector is parasitic on the public sector. So they need the central bank for currency. They need the central bank for collateral. They need government debt for collateral so that they can use government debt in the shadow banking system uh, through this... Um, repo market where they exchange uh, a collateral uh, a, a treasury bill for cash cash in the pension funds and that way they, they're conducting a banking system out there without any regulation but without the collateral they get from government debt and from central banks they can't do this right they depend on the state to bail them out when things go wrong right and I don't mind bailing out Wall Street. I don't even mind bailing out um, the City of London. What I mind is that we did it on no conditions. There were no terms and conditions. We should have said, yes, you can have a bailout, but you will lend money to your economy. You will lend money to the people who need blah, blah. You will do this, that, and the other. In return for the state bailing you out, we did nothing. We just said, take the money and run. And they did, right? So there's that. So we underestimate our power and their degree to which they depend on public resources. And the most important one is the power of taxation, right? The thing about the taxation system is that if you're a big corporation and you dig diamonds, there's just that many diamonds and you've got to go out and sweat for them and everything, 
and the price of diamonds comes up and down. Taxation is legal. You legally enforce and oblige the citizens of your country to pay taxes. Now, they play around and they try and avoid the taxes, no question. But I can't avoid taxes. I don't know about you, but I've got to pay PAYE or, you know, self-employment taxes. And I get into big trouble if I don't. And I don't choose not to. Most of us are legal. Most of us obey the law. So what you have then is you have a state which has this revenue that is coming in consistently and reliably every year. Not just for the next year, not just the next 10 years, for the next 100 years. So when Argentina was granted a bond issue for 100 years, that's because of course international credits believed that Argentina would be there in 100 years and her, tax, her people would still be paying taxes. And those revenues are used to pay the rent on the collateral, which is the public debt, right? <coughs> we are the ones who are keeping this whole show on the road. We, we underestimate that power. And we don't use that power as leverage against the private sector. And that's not by accident. They have persuaded us, and this is where their power is important, through the media or through ideology or through university courses or via central bankers, to believe that they are indispensable and that they are doing us all a big favour, that we don't owe them, that, you know, they... Well, we're obliged to them because, thank God, they're going to invest a few pennies in our economy and if we upset them, they won't. So I want us to understand that and to understand that we can have leverage over these. Now, who, who has the political will to do that? Well, I've no, I know no politician today that has got that kind of gumption. But I do remember Roosevelt, because Roosevelt stood up on the day of his inauguration and attacked the finance sector, Wall Street, and on the Sunday, he said to his staff, we're getting them to withdraw gold. We want their gold. And we've got to put it in the Treasury. They are no longer going to determine the value of the United States exchange rate from tomorrow. And they said, you can't do that on Sunday because it's a holy day. You'll have to wait till Monday. So he waited till Monday, closed the banks, collected the gold, and then took the power to fix the exchange rate of the United States to himself, essentially, democratically elected. He fiddled with it, he didn't do it terribly well, but it was the concept of taking the power from Wall Street and giving it to the democratic institution, which is the thing that, that he did. He had the courage to do that. We don't have Roosevelt's today, so that's a problem. But we have you, and you're thinking, you're reading, you're understanding, you're learning, you are going to be providing, if you like, the ideas and, and the, the discourse which is going to lead to the next leader that will do a Roosevelt. I'm just so convinced of that, you know. I remember that um, in, in 2007, I would never have had an audience like this. I would never have been invited to speak at a conference yes. like this. Yes, yes. <laughs> you, know, do you, do you know what I mean? The, there was, was it? Well, there were very few pe people and institutions that listened to these papers and read these papers. But I just heard your questions to Mr. Trichet, and what it taught me, showed me was how well informed you all are. You know? So we are looking towards you. you know? I'm past it. You've got to do it. <laughs> now, as to the question of is it revolutionary enough, should we have more state planning? Absolutely, yes. And I think planning will be terribly important because I think we're going to have to practice rationing. We're going to have to ration who uses what because we, we know we have finite resources. We don't live in a world of infinite resources. And so rationing it would be the fairest way of handling that. That's a radical thought. And when we tried to, well, it was done during the war in Britain and actually people benefited enormously. And this comes back to public opinion. Because the public has been persuaded by the media or whatever that actually we should be grateful for these oligarchs. But actually the, the public is mad as hell at the moment that they pay their taxes, but Amazon doesn't pay its taxes. They know there's something badly wrong. They're not stupid, but they don't know there's no politician representing them or arguing for them. And I think that, that when, when it comes to the crunch, the public would like it very much <laughs> if they got paid a bit more if they had a bit more security, and, and, and if the whole system was fairer. So, so I think you know, we've got a problem with powerful 
oligarchs who, do, who dictate um, the, the ideology and the debates and so on, but that's changing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's only the far right who are representing those that concern. It's only the AFD in Germany, it's only, you know, Mrs. Uh, Watchman called it in Italy, who is speaking for that unrest and that unhappiness. Ve nobody on the left, no social democrat in Europe is, is giving voice to that concern in Europe. And that, for me, is why we're going to get fascism. And <laughs> I hate to be cheerful about this, but it's coming, you know, and we have to face that. But what we could do is nurture alternative ideas and push those as well. Um, thank you very much. My name is Cara. I'm from Austria. Um, I would actually like to come back to what Nina already started. Um, and I'm also completely with you on the entrepreneurial state and that we need to do that. But I would like to come back to the finance and, a finance and aspect, especially how this aspect would be reconcilable if, you, if we think about climate justice on an international level between the global north and the global south. Yeah. And if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on that, how maybe how this could be financed and if so, what would need to happen. Yeah. We take two questions here and then yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Maike, I come from Germany. I was just wondering, because you said that there is going to be the crash and then build, like based on that we can basically like try and rebuild our in the ideal state of course, but then I was wondering how do you see the potential for like there not to be another moment of like, okay, these institutions are too big to fail and we see how like people are suffering if these banks for example are not existing anymore like how do you see the potential of what can be done that this is not just going to repeat itself again sorry could you just tell me your question again i didn't quite register it basically how uh how the financing aspect of what All you're right. proposing is reconcilable with uh, okay. climate justice yeah 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 Start yeah, I think because there's so much to think about. Number one, on the global south, um, I come from there, so I, I'm really clear on all this, at least as clear as I can be. Um, the fact of the matter is that if we have a more managed global economy, we will have greater policy autonomy for countries. Right now, the problem is, I think in South Africa, South Africa has no control over the value of her currency. She has no control over the cost of borrowing. Uh, she has um, no control of what gets dumped on her economy by rich countries. I was hearing about the islands in the Pacific who have been forced under the World Trade Organization to accept turkey tails, which the Americans are not allowed to eat because there's no nutritional value in them, but that were forced upon the island people as part of the WTO agreement. So whoever was producing turkey tails wanted somewhere to sell them and so made it as a condition of membership of the World Trade Organization so the Pacific Islands could sell their coconuts that they should be forced to accept turkey tails. So, you know, we have, they look, these countries lack control over their, over their borders and, over, and this causes unease at home and it causes uh, the problem. That, so, so the whole point about the managed global economy is that it gives greater policy autonomy to governments and that it deepens democracy because it means governments can pay attention to what's happening here at home rather than pay attention to export markets and what's happening abroad. So, you know, that's how I think that can happen. Then when you have policy autonomy, you, uh, you were able to have a central bank, you know, and you're able to do what our central bank could do. Our central bank could find 93 billion euros to bail out the finance sector in 2007-9. That is a great power, which, which comes from a, a monetary system that over time we've developed and that we've built. Malawi doesn't have that power. Many countries in the South don't have that power because they don't have the institutions. And the IMF says to them, don't worry about building the institutions. You can always borrow dollars from the rest of the world, right? 
and they do, and they get into terrible debt. And debt. So in Bogota last week, I listened to a government minister just say that they, would, they want to do so much, they've got a new progressive uh, government, but they can't because of the debt, because they've got a big overhang of debt. They have to import iPhones or whatever, and they can't pay for it. So, um, so this system, this, these imbalances are brought about by the fact that, that power has been removed from governments. And the whole point about <laughs> this other the system that we're talking about is that it restores power. And your question, sorry. Um, yeah, how can you ensure and sorry that and if you and if countries are allowed to develop monetary institutions, they will be able to do what the bank, this ECB, can do to conjure money out of, you know, what is it, you know, out of thin air. Um, and, and not even, but because that's what an institution, a monetary institution, gives to a country. But most poor countries don't have developed monetary institutions. Sorry. Um, like, how do you see the potential for, or how can you ensure that there's not just going to be another repetition of when the banks fall, like big institutions fall, that there's not just going to be this, like, too big to fail mentality, and then it's all going to repeat itself again? Well, the thing is, you know, if you get Donald Trump in the United States, and that now seems likely, I'm not entirely, conf I personally don't think he will win, but many people think he does. If you get fascist leaders, they will, they will take over the central bank. Now, there will be collusion between capital and, and, and authoritarian leaders, but authoritarian leaders make it very, very tough for capitalism. You know, they, they mess up the system. Uh, just in the way that Trump has done, for example, already and will do when Steve Bannon is running the White House. So, um, so then the question is, you know, if, if capital allows or carries on the way it's been carrying on, I mean, I noticed Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan endorsing Trump the other day because well, they want to just get in there and persuade him to do another too big to fail story. But the problem is his, his, his base is deeply, deeply opposed to, the, to sort of looking after the 1% and not them. So I, I don't know. I think it'll be very messy and horrible. But I don't think it's going to be a repetition of 2007-9. Two last questions. Yes. And then. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Pranandita. I'm from India. Uh -huh. uh, I have a very cliche question. I am thinking that there is a lot of romance around the idea of a revolutionary state in countries that have not seen the worst of the planned economies uh, because the planned economies of the past were anything but ecological. So how does one prevent the same kind of appropriation of authority by an elite? That's a good question, and it's too difficult for me to answer. It's a big question. It's about, you know, whether or not we empower the people to be able to, 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 to uh, monitor their politicians and get a grip on their politicians and elect politicians who look after their interests, you know. Um, but you, there can be no guarantee against getting big, bad Soviet-style states back in. Um, they were, you know, and they gave planning a very bad name. But you don't have to be a Soviet-style state if you plan properly for your, uh, for your economy. So it doesn't have to be like that. But of course, you're right, there's a memory of that and, and that it, it became authoritarian, essentially. And I don't know how you prevent that except through education, empowerment of the populace, basically. Um, that, I'm bullshitting now. I think you should let me go. <laughs> last question, last question. Um, um, I'm Yaksh. I'm also from India. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, firstly. Um, I am fully agreeable with everything you say here. Um, I just find one thing missing uh, in the discourse over the past two hours, uh, yeah. which I would really like your comment on. It's related to what Kara said earlier about the global north-south discourse and the financial aspect of it. And also the fact that Pranandita just mentioned that some countries in the global south have actually not had such a bad experience with social planning, for example. And here I bring up the example of India because, um, I mean, of course, yeah. India has made its mess with social planning. But when you say that banks are too big to fail, things like that don't exist in the global south, for example, because big banks in India still fail. 
and big banks in India still make rich people and poor people alike lose their money mostly the poor people because they are the ones who are the who but are the, the state doesn't def- doesn't rescue them no and uh, the point here being that and this is the point that I found missing over the discourse is that there is something very strongly related to the hierarchy of currencies here because there are some currencies which can be printed endlessly and be used to bail out banks but the Indian rupee is not one of that currencies right. uh, and there are other currencies in the global search which, which don't have that kind of power your example of Malawi also fits there yeah so w- do you think something like this could be solved uh, if, if we say that we want uh, a different um, global center of power to take over for example uh, like you said like you mentioned the the ECB uh, the Bank of England or uh, the US um, a yeah. dollar uh, it's not coincidence that they also happen to be uh, the currencies in which the SDRs are measured for example right. or the Japanese yeah. uh, bank and my problem here is that um, when we have ecological discussions around these currencies and these banks it by default discounts the losses and the performance capacities which do not exist in the global south for example mm-hmm. I, I would really like to know what you think about this. Um, I think it's a very big question and I thank you for it. Um, and yes, I, it hadn't occurred to me, of course India doesn't bail out its banks. Um, it's really the question of the dominance of the dollar and how wrong that is. Um, and can I say that because I don't have time to go into this with you because it's a very big subject. Can I recommend you read Michael Pettis and in particular his article in the Carnegie um, Endowment for Peace, I think it's called International Peace. He writes about the dominance of the dollar and he, his argument, which I once disagreed with but I now agree with, is that the dollar is dominant because of the nature of the export orientation of our economies, right? So, so the, the American worker has to suck up all the demand that there is not in Germany or that there is not in China. It has to, they have to generate demand to deal with all of the stuff that China and Germany are producing. And he's arguing that that, that imbalance, if you like, and it comes back to J.A. Hobson, essentially, that imbalance is what's made the, um, the dollar so powerful. But it doesn't serve the interests of the American working class, which is why they're voting for Trump, essentially. It hurts their interests because they lose their jobs to China, etc., etc. Um, so um, he argues, and I think he's correct on this after thinking about it for some time, that actually you've got to alter the, syst- the imbalances in the system, trade imbalances in particular in order to solve the problem of the dominance of the dollar. Now, I've always said the dollar is dominant and it's the selfish Americans and they, they, they and I heard uh, uh, Triche say that too, I think, which is that they just, uh, they spend money that, you know, because they've got the dollar, they can spend blah. But actually, he's right in saying the Americans are hurt by these imbalances and by the power of the dollar. And the fact that it becomes very strong, especially in crises, which makes American exports uncompetitive, which means their businesses go bust, and which at the same time they've got to buy all that the world is producing, you know. So, um, so it comes back to the reason the dollar is dominant is because of those deficits and surpluses, right? If you, if you iron them out, and this brings me back to the clearing union and the debate, there's a wonderful book, by the way, by my friends, Luca Fantacci and Massimo Amato, that have written a book called The End of Finance. And they're experts on the European Payments Union, which was a form of clearing union. And they argue powerfully about how good it was at restoring uh, stability in Europe post-war. Um, but they also explain the clearing union and Keynes's thinking about it, really. And to be honest, we we need that. And I, I mean, I'm so anxious now about the way in which uh, countries of the south are demanding another currency uh, aside from the dollar, because it's not the problem. The problem isn't the currency. 
The problem is the imbalance in the, between those countries, and we've got to solve that. And give India much greater autonomy. Give India a currency which can be powerful for India, instead of having to depend on, on the dollar. So I, um, it's a big story, but I do recommend Pettis for you on this one, and you can argue with him, as I have done, but I've been persuaded in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.